Good morning, everybody. Before I get started in um, my presentation about the importance of self-care, I'd like to um, acknowledge three of Compass Regional um, staff members that um, are also here today. Sherry Tillman, one of our grief counselors. <laughs> Nancy Greenwell, our chaplain. And Lucy Hughes is in the back. She is our director of mission advancement. <laughs> and for those of you who aren't as familiar with Compass Regional Hospice and our mission, um, I just want to share just a quick little um, snippet with you about what we do. Um, through our mission and our services, we provide three different areas of care and support. Hospice, care for terminally ill patients, palliative care for those struggling with serious illness, and grief support for those who are left dealing with life's big curveballs. So I just wanted to, to kind of let you know a little bit more about what hospice does. Um, I, I, I'm a grief counselor at hospice, and I've been there for about 13 years. And in my work as a grief counselor, um, it's become part of my role to actually encourage those who are bereaved to remember to take care of themselves. When you're grieving, when you're heartbroken, when your life has just been flipped upside down, it's so easy to forget to even breathe normally or to get enough rest. And so um, self-care, I didn't even really anticipate it becoming such a large part of what I do, but it has become a very big message daily, right? So every one of us needs reminding sometimes to take care of ourselves while we're taking care of other people or while we're trying to grapple with life's big um, experiences. So um, in doing that and in learning a little bit more about self-care as, as I, um, you know, were trying to encourage other people, it also became very, um, very obvious that our staff, they really needed encouraging as well to um, do some self-care. You know, our nurses, our social workers, our chaplains, our grief counselors, even the people in our finance department, they're hearing these stories all the time. They're taking care of these patients. They're comforting families. It's so easy to be dragged down and pulled down by what's called compassion fatigue, right? And so we get so caught up in taking care of everybody else and making sure that we're doing right by them that we forget to take care of ourselves. I always think about that airplane metaphor, you know, where you get that whole spiel when you're on the plane, that when the air mask drops down, what's the first thing they tell you about that? They say, put it on, yeah, put your own on first, right? Because until you've been able to give yourself what you need, you certainly can't be what other people need, right? So I always think about that because I think it's so powerful. Um, I've also learned on a very personal level, I, first of all, I love what I do. I consider it to be a huge privilege and honor to be a part of people's grief journey, whether it's pre-death or post-death. Um, but it also takes an awful lot out of me. You know, I, I listen to their heartaches. I listen to their stories. I want to be able to encourage them in a way that's helpful to them. And so I've learned, sometimes not in the easiest way, that if I am not taking care of me, I can't be what they need. And that's the last thing I want. I want them to get what they came through that door for. So um, I, through the years, I have been invited to our local social services offices, um, health departments in all four counties, Talbot, Caroline, Kent, and Queen Anne, because I've become very passionate about the importance and the benefits of self-care. So I'd like to start with like a little warm-up activity. There's no pressure. It's just something fun. But you're all deserted on an island for the rest of your life. And you are allowed to take one book, one piece of music, and one luxury item. 
So I'm going to give you two minutes to think about what that item will be. And then hopefully we'll have some wonderful volunteers who want to share what their luxury item would be and why. So one luxury item. What would that item be? Anybody ready with their um, luxury item and care to share? Yes. My ukulele. His ukulele, and why? <coughs> so he said he would take his ukulele because it soothes him, it boosts him, it just really gives him what he needs. Great example of a luxury item that he would take, and why? Who else might want to share? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. We said luxury item, and that is your luxury item. Yeah, curl up on that bed with your favorite blankie, right? <laughs> That's what she would need to survive on this deserted island. I love it. Anyone else? Jane? <laughs> okay. I love it. So Jane would take her rosary to remind her to pray because of the isolation she might feel. Right? I actually love the fact that Jane said the word isolation because I think so often whether you are a caregiver on a personal level or even a caregiver on a professional level, we tend to feel isolated sometimes. Right? I know in hospice, oftentimes our um, support staff, they're out in the field. They're going from house to house to house. It's a lot of time in their vehicle. So you can imagine that sometimes carrying that around and not having the ability or the opportunity to, to verbalize that to someone in the moment that it's happening or to be able to say, whew, that one hit me hard, right? So whatever kind of caregiver you might be, or maybe we don't even know what the future holds for us. You know, at some time I think it's almost a given that all of us will be caring for a loved one, right? So isolation is huge. I, I like that Jane said that. Thank you, Jane. Anyone else? Their luxury item? Don't be shy. <laughs> yes. Fishing rod. Yes. <laughs> I love to fish. <laughs> and why? Well, I'd be able to eat something besides whatever fell out of the trees. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah, and you probably enjoy fishing too. Yes, yeah, so it would, it would have a lot of benefits for you, right? So often we know what it is that makes us feel good or that we want to do in our spare time, but so often we don't make that time to, to do those things. Um, we often feel really guilty about taking time for ourselves. That's one of the biggest mistakes we can make, is thinking that the care that we give other people is more important than the care we give ourselves, right? So thank you for those who were able to share their answers. I really appreciate it. So my um, uh, cohort at hospice, Sherry, is going to do a little bit of um, documenting for us on our pad, because um, we're going to talk about some of the negative effects of when we do not have a healthy self-care routine. Okay, and so we're just gonna kind of do this in popcorn answers. So please just feel free to throw them out. But what are some of the negative effects of not having a healthy, regular self-care plan? Anger. Anger, very good. You can lift that up, here you go. Oh, you know what, I didn't have to, sorry. <laughs> there we go, yeah. Okay. Anger. I love that you said that. That's so honest, right? You know, and I'm always saying this to people. Is it wrong to be angry? No. Never. It's a human emotion. Most of the time what gets us into a little bit of trouble is what we're either choosing to do with the anger or maybe we're not acknowledging at all, right? Unacknowledged pain has such a negative effect on our whole psyche, our mind, body, and spirit, holding on to unacknowledged pain, and it can lead to anger. Great first answer. Someone else? Guilt. Guilt, another huge one. Guilt is a huge part of the caregiving journey. Um, guilt is a part of the grief journey, and, and guilt is so heavy. 
Uh, it's such a burden. Most of the time that we do have guilt, is it justified? Is it like, is it factual? Most of the time it's not. It's something as human beings we create in our own mind because it's just part of that human journey, trying to figure everything out. But most of the time, guilt is not actually based on fact, okay? I mean, you might have a little bit of remorse over something you didn't say or you did say, but ultimately, a lot of the guilt we carry is just something that we've created in our mind because we feel like we could have done better with something or we could have been there more often. I try to tell that to the kids in our grief groups. We do a lot of grief work in the schools. Guilt is a big part of our kids' grief journey. That can you imagine being at a young age and having to carry that big burden around, right? Um, someone else, negative effects of not having a healthy, regular self-care plan. Fatigue. Fatigue, absolutely. And I mentioned earlier compassion fatigue, and then there's just physical fatigue. Um, emotional fatigue, mental fatigue, oh my goodness. How many of you have noticed sometimes when you're busy caring for someone else, you can barely function mentally. You can't remember the things you've always been able to remember regularly. Um, it feels like you're, you're almost, you have a diagnosis yourself, right? I've been asked that, it's true, isn't it? And I've been asked that before when we're doing counseling. So I think I have the um, early onset of dementia. That's what, intense stress and pressure can feel like, right? Someone else. Anxiety, Anxiety for sure. But you, you guys really came out of the gate good. Those are four of the, the strongest and most common negative effects. Did you raise, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> Anxiety for sure, yes. Depression. Absolutely, depression. And that can be real prominent when you're feeling so isolated from the people that you're usually, um, you know, usually are in your life. Especially if you are caregiving for a loved one, um, your life tends to become something completely different than you've than you've always known. Yeah, I was going to say isolation because you're you're not going out and about. Absolutely, isolation is huge. You're exactly right. Yes. Absolutely, frustration. How overwhelming is this? Anger, guilt, fatigue, anxiety, depression, isolation, frustration. Yet sometimes, well, and go ahead, and grief, right? There's anticipatory grief, the, that anticipation, anticipation of your loved one and and their their illness and what the end result will be, and then there is the grief following it, and that's overwhelming, all-encompassing. So absolutely, I'm glad you said that, yes. I don't think you can take depression and put all that in parentheses. Yes, I do too. That's a great point. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Because someone who is struggling with depression is feeling yes. all of those things, aren't yes. they? Like depression is the umbrella, mm -hmm. right? Very good. I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any more answers that you can think of? Yes. Okay. Um, I think um, physical illness, true physical illness. Yes. I manifest everything that way. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't give myself time for any of those. Yeah. So it's not until I get physically, literally sick that I can stop. That that gets your attention then, right? Right. When your body finally goes, whoa, Kathy. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I think that that's a common thread also. Um, but we forget about that. It really does compromise our physical well-being. Anyone else? What about substance abuse? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I always like to tell this story. Um, because it's such a it's a human nature thing to look for ways to self medicate when you really don't know where else to go or who to talk to or what to do for yourself. And years ago, I was doing some grief counseling with this um, wonderful lady, and her mom had passed, and I saw her for quite a while, and 
I am very careful not to tell someone how they should be doing their grief journey. But as it presents itself, I plant little seeds of, you might want to think about doing this, or you might want to think about doing that. And so on a regular basis, she had mentioned to me that she was drinking wine every night. And so when the moment presented itself, I said, let's talk about, you know, you're drinking wine every night, because alcohol's a depressant, right? And she was so great. She said, I know, I know what you're going to say. I know it's not good. I know I shouldn't be drinking that every night. And I said, well, it's a depressant, and you're struggling with depression. So it's, it's definitely not helping. And she says to me, as serious as anything, I'm not going to drink wine when I get home tonight. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to have a gin and tonic. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> True story. And I thought to myself, note to self, say the word alcohol, not just wine. <laughs> but that was a great point. That is so, um, such a real thing. People turn to ways to numb themselves, right? But what happens when the numbness wears off? <laughs> Reality. It's still there, right? So unless we can develop healthy ways to cope with that, there's, there, we're just going to keep spinning. I always think about that. It's almost just kind of like spiraling constantly and not regaining your balance. Anyone else? These are great answers. They're really, really wonderful. All right. Thank you, Sherry. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, is, how many people in here are familiar with Wayne Dyer? He's a wonderful motivational speaker. And he did a lot of work on self-care um, and actually all kinds of emotional support through the years. He has since passed. I think he passed a few years ago. But um, some of his stuff that he's written has been some of my favorite things. And I refer to them um, often because I think that it's so helpful. So I would like to share with you a little um, story that he um, did at a self-care conference that he was doing years ago. So um, he brought an orange with him to the stage, and he opened up the conversation with a bright young fellow of about 12 who was sitting in the front row. If I were to squeeze this orange as hard as I could, what would come out, Dyer asked. The boy looked at him like he was crazy, and he said, well, juice, of course. Do you think apple juice would come out of this orange? And the boy laughed and he said, no. He said, what about grapefruit juice? And the boy laughed and said, no. What would come out? And the boy said, orange juice, of course. Why? Why, when you squeeze an orange, does orange juice come out? Well, it's an orange, and that's what's inside. Dyer nodded and addressed the audience. Let's assume that this orange is you and someone squeezes you, or an experience squeezes you, puts pressure on you, puts you in a new situation that you don't know how to handle. And out comes anger, bitterness, hatred, fear. Why? The answer, as our young friend has told us, is because that's what's inside. It's one of the great lessons of life, Dyer said. It doesn't matter who does the squeezing. Your mother, your brother, your children, a boss, the government, an ill family member. If someone says something or you are in a situation that causes great distress, what's going to come out of you is what's inside of you. And what's inside of you is up to you. It's your choice. When we feel pressured or stressed and we no longer react with love, that's an indication to us that something is off. It's time for balance. When what comes out of us is anything other than love, it's a message for us to remember self-care. Many of us are natural caregivers. That's, that's the heart we have. If you are an empathic person, then you allow other people's energy sometimes to drastically affect your own. Emotionally drained, physically exhausted, spiritually depleted. 
These are the symptoms of an unempowered empathic person. When negativity affects you and you feel like a squeezed orange, it's time to accept responsibility for upgrading your self-care practice. I once read an analogy very simple to that, and it was called what's in your cup. And so you, let's just say the, the analogy is you have coffee in your cup, right? And someone bumps into you and you spill this coffee out Right? So that's, it would have been, whatever was in the cup is what comes spilling out, whether it was coffee or tea or juice or whatever. So what's in your cup? What can your self-care plan do to help you fill your cup with the good things you need to take care of other people? Okay? So I'd like to take the time now, we're gonna do a self-care quiz. Feel free to keep working on that. I just want to read the, um, the little bit of information that comes with this self-care quiz. So finding a balance. Caregivers often spend a lot of time caring for the business of their families, jobs, and adjusting to their ever-changing responsibilities. Taking care of family members, household chores, and financial matters can be extremely difficult especially when someone is also a caregiver. Caregivers often overlook taking care of themselves. It's important to find a good balance between the things that, you re that really need to be taken care of and taking care of yourself. Think of it as having an emotional bank account in which you make deposits when you do things that help you relax and find comfort. Listening to your favorite music, reading, exercising, being with a favorite friend, vacationing, meditating, or other healthy activities that make you feel good. On the other hand, you will make withdrawals from your emotional bank account by doing some of the necessary things, such as the very hard work of caregiving, taking care of business, or taking care of other everyday responsibilities. You also make a withdrawal from your emotional bank account by doing things that could be harmful to yourself, both physically and emotionally. Just as in our financial lives, it is important to maintain a positive balance. Make sure your withdrawals are not, not exceeding your deposits. To see how well you're doing with your own emotional and physical bank account, please take the self-care quiz. So who feels comfortable volunteering how they feel? You don't have to say your score, but maybe were you surprised? Are you concerned? Do I have any volunteers who feel comfortable enough to share that, their thoughts? Okay. Way low. And can I say that out loud for those who didn't hear you? She said she knew that she was low, but she didn't realize that she was that low, that she wasn't taking care of herself the way that she needs to. And that's exactly why I thought it was important to just for all of us to get that gauge, right? The only way we can improve or get better is to have an idea of where we are. I think it's human nature to say, well, I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I keep going, <laughs> right? <laughs> but what's in your cup, right? Or what's coming out of you when you get squeezed? I really appreciate your honesty, because that's a, it, it's a strong epiphany, isn't it, when that light bulb goes off. Someone else? Yes. No, I'm just thinking I'm pretty good, and that's not right. Okay. <laughs> so you thought you were doing better. Well, no, I think I need help. Okay. But I scored out on a 27. Now that I must oh. have done something right. I, I'm sure you did something right. Well, what makes you feel like you need help? Because I get tired of doing it. Absolutely, yeah. But yet, on your self-care quiz, you felt like you were taking time for yourself? Well, I, every morning I take at least an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, to do my Bible reading and stuff. I think that's wonderful. And that's what gets me. And when you said about the desert island, I would take the Bible. I love because it. Because that it's entertainment. Yes, it is. It gives you hope. <laughs> mm -hmm. Shows you love. Yeah. I mean. It's full of everything. That's right. Yeah. But then again, I 
I feel like, you know, I should do physical exercise and that. Okay. But I also have a bone like this. Mm -hmm. So that makes, that's why. Yeah, that's your reality, yeah. right? So obviously there's always going to be areas in which we feel like we could or should be doing better. I love your mornings. I think it's great. I, absolutely. And I think you're a beautiful example of you can still be setting a little bit of time aside, but still at the end of the day you're tired. Right. And and you just feel like, oh my gosh, how long do I have to do this? That's so when you pray again. That's when you pray again. That's right. You do whatever works for you whatever you have to be very in touch with your own needs you know I love the ukulele um, example that feeds him that gives him um, nourishment for his soul so thank you so much for sharing anyone else yes you have to do it to be nourished mm -hmm. I find myself not doing it very often I graded myself as when I did the total, I did 11. It shocked me. It did. I thought I was really great. <laughs> <laughs> he thought he was doing much better, but he, he scored kind of low. Um, and he said that the important thing about the ukulele is he actually needs to do it for it to nourish his soul. And so obviously with you being a caregiver, you're not getting the time to, to really do that as much as you, you long to do it, right? Well, taking it. What I find is that I have kind of like... I'm very fortunate there's an organization in town here, Commercial Club, mm -hmm. Serenity Enhancement. Yes. <laughs> My wife goes there, and so from 8-ish in the morning until 2.30 in the afternoon, she tracks my commuting time. Mm -hmm. she, she's in good hands. Mm -hmm. Gives me time to do things, but it ends up that what I'm doing is painting, laundry, shopping, the busyness, yeah, yeah. You're doing the necessary, yeah. And you need a little bit more time for soul nourishment, right? Someone else who cares to share? Thank you so much. Someone else? How many people, just raise your hand, if you were surprised by your score? Okay, so it's quite a few people. Out of those who raised their hand, Raise your hand if you thought you were doing better. Okay. All right. So the ones who didn't just raise your hand, you're actually doing better than you thought? Good. Good. I think that's a good thing. Can you come up and help me do this workshop? <laughs> I think you probably have some good things to offer. <laughs> So thank you for taking that. And again, the only reason that I felt that it was very important um, is because it's always good to have a gauge, right? We need to know where we're at so we can either start to, you know, to be, do better by ourselves, right? Um, know when to ask for help. So thank you for that. So now um, we are actually going to, Sherry, would you come back up? And we're going to talk about the benefits of having a good self-care plan. So we talked about some of the negative effects of not having a good routine. Now let's hear, especially from those who were, um, did fairly well in their score, hopefully you've got some real good answers to throw out there um, that will help some of our other folks who feel like they could be doing better. Okay? So what does self-care mean to you? And you can just do this again in popcorn answers. What does good self-care look like to you? I think I've learned for the years and the experiences that I've found and learned that it's okay for me to take care of me, for me to be selfish once in a while. And I think that I've learned that I have to be able to do more to eat. That took some time. I love it. And is it really selfish? I that it's, not. it's not. We use that word, right? And it's such a negative word. But it's necessary, right? So I love that you said that. And you're right. It is okay to take care of you. Sometimes it takes us a little while to get there, doesn't it? A while to get there. Me too. <laughs> Me too. Someone else? What does good self-care look like for you? What would be the benefits? Quiet. Absolutely. I um, 
in January, I don't know. I you know I don't know if it was the winter blues. Um, I don't know if it was post holiday blues. But I about mid January, I became very aware that I was very frustrated with what was on TV, like the news. I got I get up every morning. I, first thing I do is turn on the TV so that the local news is running in the background. And I decided, and I've done that for years, right? So that's a hard habit to break. I just felt like I needed it, like the white noise almost. I decided to turn off the TV and not turn it on anymore in the morning because I found that that was setting the, the tone for my day, whether it's politics or crime or, you know, whatever it was, that negativity I felt like was owning me. And so I stopped. I haven't turned it on since January. And for me, this is a personal thing, but I replaced it with some of my favorite Christian music. That uplifts me. That puts the positive message in my heart and in my head for the day. So I love that you said quiet, um, because quiet, those times are so important. And then when you decide that you're ready for a little noise, being very aware of what works for you, right? Um, other other answers? Jane? I found a journal that helped me so that I could write down my experiences each day and recap them at the end of each day. I really love that. And what I want to say about journaling is it's almost a little bit like what we do with the idea of a self-care plan. We make it harder than it has to be. Journaling can be the easiest activity you do. Nobody's going to look at it. It's just for your eyes. If anybody looks in my journal, they're going to swear I'm schizophrenic. I'm not kidding. Because it's full of scriptures, positive affirmations, my thoughts from the day before. But it's mine. It's, it's 150% mine. So, Jane, I love that idea. Journaling is an awesome way to take care of yourself. And, again, don't overthink it. We sometimes cover it in our grief groups, and sometimes we'll just say, start with a word. Start with the word grief. Go down your page, you know, G, and write a sentence that starts with each letter. Journaling can be that easy and that random in a sense, right? Oh, I love that. Yeah. Three things. Three things that she is grateful for. That's how she ends her journal entries. That's a beautiful. <laughs> hey, because that's real life, right? Yeah. Not every day feels like a beautiful sunset. <laughs> so that's very real. But you know, they've proven to have a grateful heart. You start to change your mindset. No matter how bad our situation is, if you can find that one thing in that day, or if you're lucky enough, three, that you're grateful for, you will change your mindset. Right? Seems so simple, but it is powerful. Other ideas? What does self-care mean to you? I'm going to share with somebody else that we were in a discussion about things to be grateful for. Okay. And she said, sometimes the only thing I've got to be grateful for is that my hair is not on fire. <laughs> so there's always something to be grateful and for. And I like that too because it's humorous, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, there's always something to be grateful for, even if it is the fact that your, your hair is not on fire. <laughs> Why not, right? Humor is so important. Other answers? Favorite hobby. Favorite hobby. Yeah, whatever that is, right? Maybe you're someone who enjoys making something. Maybe you're someone who enjoys fishing, right? Um, I love anything outdoors. I just, I feel fed when I'm outside. I, that's when I feel my best. Whether I'm just sitting in a chair or whether I'm fishing <laughs> um, or whether I'm enjoying my grandkids, it, it, if I'm outside, then I'm getting something that my soul needs. So I love that, a favorite hobby. So often, though, when we are caregiving, even engaging in our favorite hobby feels like the farthest thing away. Right, And so maybe sometimes little tricks of the trade might be to have a little corner of your house that's always set up for you. So that when you have 10 or 15 minutes, go sit down and do it. Eventually, I think that you'd start to feel the benefits of at least even being able to do it for just a few minutes. You know, self-care plans, we think it has to look really big and really grand. Like, it has, to, it has to be yoga every other day, or it has to be powerful meditations. It doesn't have to be. 
It doesn't have to be at all. It can be the most simple of things. Reading your devotion every single morning, right? Turning the TV off and replacing it with something beautiful. Other answers? I just think, too, just crying. Sometimes you have to do that. I agree. I agree. Because you'd be so strong. Yeah. You want to be strong for everybody yep. else. And sometimes you forget to cry because you hurt so bad. Crying is a release of all that. I couldn't agree more. I love that you said that. She said crying, right? So often we hold on to that because we think we're always supposed to be strong. Does crying make you less strong? Absolutely not. We are made this way for a reason. And tears are often a part of a stress release for us. Um, They're also the sign of an unspeakable love. Tears really are an indication for unspeakable love. So if you're caregiving for someone that you love with all your heart, it's only natural that you're going to have to sometimes let those tears flow. Right? Other answers? Yes. Engaging with friends. I love it. Engaging with friends, whatever that looks like. If you can't get away from your house very often, have them come to you. Right? Hang out with some of your favorite people. I always tell people who are grieving that everybody who is broken hearted needs to have a little team behind them of two or three people. Two or three people you know you can call any time of the day with any kind of venting you need to do and that person's always got your back. It's the same thing when you're a caregiver. You need a little team behind you. Those people who are there for you no matter what. Your go-tos. Okay. Other answers? Dancing. Dancing. Yeah, I love that. (laughs) Dancing, laughing, singing, being silly. Those are great ways to self-care. How good do you feel after a really good laugh? Have you ever had a laugh start that's your belly laughing and then it turns to tears? What's that about? That happens because you have this sitting right here. And what starts out funny is all of a sudden this huge release. And you think, what's wrong with me? (laughs) But yes, dancing. So we know that dancing and music are all great ways for self-care. Other ideas? Yes? Absolutely. Absolutely. Those of you who have pets, whether it's a cat or a dog, great therapy in that. Um, Katie had mentioned earlier that Camp New Dawn is one of our programs at Compass Regional Hospice. And for the last few years, we've actually had um, pet therapy dogs come out. We usually have them attend the group where the kids are asked to write a letter to the loved one who has passed. So they get this nurturing and this love and this comfort while they're pouring out their heart. It's worked amazing. So you are so right. Pet therapy. If you don't have a dog, make sure you have a friend that has a dog. (laughs) Other ideas? What self-care looks like for you? Anyone else? Step outside. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And breathe. When I was getting my master's degree in counseling, um, one of our professors came in and we were getting ready to have a terrible, like, stress-filled exam and I guess the moment she walked in the room she was very aware of the tension that everybody was holding in their bodies and she called us out on it she said whoa you know you guys need to to chill out and relax and so she taught us this quick little exercise that I still do today that I have taught my clients and I've taught the kids that we do grief support with and it's very simple and you're just sitting in a chair, you make sure your back is up against the back of your chair because it sends a signal to your, your mind that you're safe, you're grounded. And you close your eyes and you take what's called three conscientious breaths. There, you inhale deeply and you exhale deeply. I always tell my kids, you inhale like you're smelling the most wonderful flower in the world and you exhale like you're blowing out your birthday candles, right? And I promise you what happens is it changes your body chemistry. 
And like I tell my clients or I tell the kids that are on my caseload, I say, if the first set of three breaths don't work, do it again. Almost always you'll feel that calming come over you. Sounds a little too simple to work, doesn't it? But I promise you, it works. Because you've stopped, you've closed your eyes, and you've mindfully set your mind up to breathe in and breathe out. And it sends a message to your brain that you're going to be okay. And it changes your chemistry in that moment. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Any other answers up here? Okay. Well, we'll move right along then. Actually, if you want to lift that up, that'd be great. So I wanted to talk a little bit about stress management and self-care, right? A lot of times people use these two terminologies as interchangeable, you know, very similar. And they can be very similar. But stress management is coping with the negative effects of the stress that we are experiencing. It's all about coping, okay? Where self-care is proactively enhancing our health by building resilience and preventing illness and disease. It's a preventative focus. Like Kathy said earlier, sometimes when she's under a great deal of stress, what stops her finally is that she gets sick or she feels the effects of what she's going through physically, and, it, and then her physical health is compromised, right? So remembering that stress management is some of your coping skills, right? But a good self-care plan is almost about being proactive, right? So when Kathy said that, having a good regular self-care plan, she becomes proactive to the physical illness that could occur because of the stress that she's under. Does that make sense? Um, I think I actually put this, I might not have, I have another handout for you. Yeah, I didn't put it on there. So if you, can everybody see that okay? Because I can repeat it. Let me know if you need me to read it again. Okay, so I just thought that's important to go over because sometimes we do think that stress management and self-care are the same things. But remember, your self-care plan is proactive. Coping is what you're doing almost in that moment, right? While you're experiencing it. Okay? All right, so I am going to have my helper friends... <laughs> pass out another handout and we will go over that together. So how do we easily create our self-care plan? And um, once all the handouts are out, we'll talk about that. Okay, does everybody have a handout? Okay, so how we start to create a self-care plan. It's called the ABC method, right? So the A stands for awareness. And I'll go back to my wonderful friend here who is very aware that his ukulele can bring him a, a self-soothing sort of benefit, right? So being aware of what it is that you need, right? All of us need different things. Some of us need quiet. Some of us need to be with people. Some of us need to be outside. Some of us prefer a quiet chair. So what is it that you need? So being very aware of what works for you. If you are someone who doesn't like yoga, you don't want to take up yoga, no matter how many benefits there are to it. Because will you stick to it? No. It will become a chore, the direct opposite of what we want when we're creating a self-care plan. Right? So an awareness of your own needs. And I'll go to my friend who said that every morning she spends time with the Bible and her devotions. And that is what gets her through the day. So knowing what your needs are. What, what feeds your soul? What fills your cup? So that you can deal with all the big things that you're dealing with. 
and we were talking earlier about what self-care looks like for you so again that might be a hobby it might be fishing it might be hanging out with your favorite friend okay and then the B is for balance there lies the challenge right always needing um, the, the wisdom to know how to balance those things out I'm not sure there's any real um, easy way to do that except that you just have to keep checking yourself. Maybe that's where that self-care quiz can come in handy. Keep it. Look at it every now and again. Right? Recheck yourself. See how you're doing. Are you giving yourself everything you need to handle everything that you're going through? Whether you are a professional caregiver or you're doing it on a personal level, okay? And then the third, the C to ABC is connection, right? So the connection is, again, maintaining the supportive relationships. Remember I said that about everybody needs like a little team behind them, whether it's two or three people, whether you're grieving, whether you are um, someone's caregiver, whether you have a, a very demanding job, you need to know who it is that you can go to in any given moment who's always going to make sure that they have time for you. Right? Because that will help you avoid the silence. And I mentioned earlier about break the silence of, of un, unacknowledged pain. How often do you think we walk around with this pain sitting right here and we never acknowledge it? Do you think that happens often? I think it happens all the time. Yeah. Sometimes it's too hard to say out loud. Sometimes it's that we don't want to bother anybody with what we think is, you know, insignificant. But break the silence of unacknowledged pain. You deserve it. That's a great point. She said a lot of times you don't even know that you have it, right? Yeah, that's a very good point. So true. Great point. Sometimes, and, and really that's what Kathy was saying earlier, like you're not even aware of the toll it's taken on you until it slaps you in the face, right? So... Good point. What do you think about the framework ABC? Does it does it put it into perspective a little bit for you? Yeah, I like it. You do? I think I like it because I think it's it's somewhat simplistic. Just be aware. Aware of your own needs. Raise your hand if you feel like you, confidently you are aware of what you need. Okay, so it aware of what Exactly. Right? Yeah, that is the challenge. And, but I didn't see a lot of hands go up, too. So I think that really actually speaks to the fact that sometimes we don't know what we need, right? But knowing what brings you comfort, right? Whatever that looks like for you, um, that's what you need to be aware of. And then creating a balance, right? I raise your hand if you think that creating that balance is probably one of the hardest parts. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Making that time and making it imperative that you have that time for self-care, right? Yeah. But I like this acronym. I just think it's easy to relate to. The ABC method, right? So I also wanted to share with you just four easy tips about creating a self-care plan. Again, I'll just, number one is, don't do things that you hate. If you're someone who doesn't like meditation, or you find it hokey, don't do it, right? If you're someone that thinks yoga is ridiculous, don't do it. Find that thing that makes you feel good. It doesn't have to look like what everybody else is doing, okay? I love to read. That is one of my escapes. Do I get enough time to read what I really want to read or, or you know, um, sit there for a long time and read what I want to read? No. So now I've 
taken to carrying my Kindle so that when I have 10 minutes, I can read. It's helped because then at least I feel like I'm getting little snippets of an escape throughout the day. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing is plan it. Schedule it. Is it going to be in your mornings? Is it going to be at the end of the day? Can it be at the middle of the day? If you're someone who works in the mental health field or as, um, as a caregiver professionally, can you take your lunch break down by the water? You know, can you just take a drive? We live in one of the most beautiful areas. You know, little tricks like that. Ten minutes of just sitting and looking at nature. Right? So plan it if you can. That'll help carry it through, right? If you plan it most of the time, it'll become part of your routine. Most of the time we just keep saying we're going to do it. You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> Keep it simple. Remember that it does not have to look fancy and it doesn't have to be expensive. It really doesn't even have to cost anything. Reading your Bible doesn't cost anything, does it? No. Nope. So remember that, that it does not have to be fancy or expensive. It doesn't have to look like a big vacation away, although if you can do that, please do it. <laughs> but it doesn't have to be, you know, a big grand getaway. Um, it could be an afternoon. It could be a couple of hours. It could be lunchtime with a great girlfriend. And then remain flexible. This is my biggest challenge. I feel like when I've decided to create some kind of self-care routine for me, and if I don't get to do it the way I've mapped it out, I am a failure. Mm. And then that just really, I'm almost my worst enemy when it comes to that. So be patient with yourself. Be really, really flexible. Right? That's what it takes. It's not going to fall into place smoothly and beautifully. You have to keep plugging away at it. Okay. Does anybody have any questions or thoughts? Did, raise your hand if you feel like you're one step closer to creating some kind of a simple self-care plan. Oh, good. Good. Does anybody care to share what they are going to try to implement into their daily life? An idea? If you say it out loud, it might happen. Because I'm going to check on you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes? I may not have an idea for me, but I have suggestions. Okay. Um, because it's something I've been doing lately, and it's kind of funny, kind of hokey, but it's entering Christmas time. And the Hallmark Channel is amazing. Okay. I thought they were all goofy and simple for a long time. And I am now a total addict. But what I find myself is when I'm watching that, they're always very happy. And they have happy endings and they're wonderful. And they may come from difficult situations, though. There could be, you know, children who lost a parent or this or that. But the end result is good. And you find yourself sitting there smiling at TV. So that means you're, you're giving endorphins, your, your cortisol levels are rising. It's a healthy thing to do. So I if agree. there's anything that you watch or enjoy, you know, if you can take a little time to do that, that helps too. Something as simple yeah. as that. I think that's great <laughs> advice. And really, I mean, already people are talking about, oh, Hallmark Christmas movies are ruined. I mean, it does tell you that we're all at a, at a you know, in a time where we need to feel good about the human spirit in general. So I think it's, it's great advice. And um, my husband would probably kill me, but he absolutely loves the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> and he can't wait for the Christmas movies to come on. And he comes across as just just this gruff guy, but even he knows the benefits of happy endings or feeling like, you know, the good guy wins in the end, right? So I think that was great advice. Anyone else want to share um, maybe an idea for their self as far as, you know, creating a self-care plan, an idea you have? You know, it can be as simple as sitting outside in a chair and watching clouds. That sounds silly, right? But if you ever do it, you'll know the benefits, right? Or listening to the birds. Some of the most simple, inexpensive um, pastimes like that can really, really bring you joy. 
and we all deserve that. I wanted to end with something that I often use in my grief groups because I always feel like I want to end things on a good and positive note. But before I do that, I just want to um, open up the floor and just make sure that if there's any questions, um, anything that you might want to ask me about self-care. Maybe I didn't answer something that you came here looking for today. I'd love for you to bring it up. Good, thank so you. So how about finding the time to do it? You know, the time management aspect. Yeah, is that is the toughest piece, I think. So I think it goes back to those four tips. The one that was plan it and schedule it, right? If you have a doctor's appointment for 9 a.m., you're going to keep the doctor's appointment, right? So what's going to be your time of the day that's just for you? Yeah, but I agree with you. Because when you're going through it, it doesn't feel like you have one second to spare. Sometimes you're not even sure how you're going to get everything done that you actually have to get done. So what's going to give first? The thing you're doing for yourself. So, mm -hmm. What do you do when you plan this time and then it constantly gets interrupted? <laughs> there lies a challenge again. You know, and being, you know, it does call for flexibility, patience with yourself. I'm not. <laughs> you know, I, I can understand that. I think that there'd be a lot of people who could agree with you. She said she's lacking patience, right? I said be patient and flexible. But it's hard to be that way when you feel like, oh my gosh, I just want five minutes for myself. Or I need five minutes for myself. Yeah, and you know, a good supportive connection, like your best friend, you know, talk to them. Make them, we've got to get you one. <laughs> you know, someone who can make you. <laughs> oh, I see where you're going. <laughs> That's a different kind of workshop. <laughs> <laughs> but someone that um, can help you be accountable. You know, it's someone that can check in with you. That, that's a big deal. Yes, Jane. Reach out online, even to caregiver support groups online. Yeah. I'm too old for all that mechanical stuff. <laughs> <laughs> she said she's too old for all that mechanical stuff. <laughs> Which it does raise a good point. Sometimes that's not always the easiest method. It is a very good method, but if it's something that doesn't work for your life, yeah, yeah. So you do need someone that maybe you can call or a buddy system, right? It, that'll help you be accountable. I'm very proud of the fact that our grief team at hospice, um, I'm sorry that one of our counselors is missing today, Ann O'Connor, and she, I think she's probably become the person on our team that reminds us, are you breathing? <laughs> like, are you doing what you need to do for yourself? And to be quite honest with you, I have to have that. I have to have someone who's going to say to me, you need to go home. <laughs> or you need to not come in until later tomorrow. I get caught up because I love what I do and because it's, it's really something that's so heart-driven. So I need that person that makes me accountable, that makes me stop and think, yes, yeah, she's right. Yeah. So find that buddy, right? I'll be your buddy. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Comment, I guess one of the words that comes to my mind mm -hmm. is simplify. How can I simplify my life so that I do have time or can make the time to do some of these things? Yeah. That's a great question. She said, simplify. How can I simplify my life to guarantee that I'll have that time I need for myself? And that is, that's a huge challenge. I do think that's where, again, a buddy can help. You know, a good girlfriend or, um, you know, maybe someone from your church sit down and help you, you know, kind of map out. Maybe, you know, one day is for making sure that all the bills get paid. One day is for, I don't know, whatever the responsibilities are. And again, schedule that window of time that's just yours. Nothing else is going to interfere with it. You have to make your mind up. Nothing's going to stop me from having this 30 minutes, 
20 minutes, whatever it is. But you're right, it's hard. It's hard to know where to start to simplify. I wish I had a surefire solution for that, but I think it looks different for each person. It can be so individualized depending on what it is that, that you're battling, right? Any other questions? Do you ever work with couples and they reach out to us like we, you know, my best friend, talk to my best friend about the same thing yeah. that he's going through, that I'm going through, mm-hmm. and we're both angry, we're both frustrated, we're both all of those things. Yeah. And we have friends outside of each other, obviously. But, yeah. You know, how do you handle that? I think that you just asked a great question. I think that, yeah, and yes, we do. We help couples. We help families. Um, You know, our mission at hospice is to make any kind of these journeys that you are on easier, um, more manageable, validate where you're at, you know, validate how you're feeling, and so that you do have a safe place to kind of purge your frustration without feeling like you're dumping it on each other. So yeah, we will help you in any way we can with that. Um, we have been talking about going into the new year, actually creating, you know, a caregiver group so that there is this safe place to come. And it's just about caregivers and how they're feeling. You know, we've seen it in our grief groups. When you are with people who are on a similar walk, that's where you get your greatest amount of comfort. Yeah. So we're going to work on that. And in the meantime, you can call us. Yeah. And I'm sorry because it's, it's an incredible amount of pressure. Other questions? Ideas? I read a quote recently credited to Henry Ford. Okay. It says, if you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're right. Henry Ford, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Sometimes it just still feels so lonely out there when you're fighting, you know, when you're fighting a fight, right? Anyone else? Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to share one of my favorite, favorite things in the whole world. (laughs) Again, when I'm doing grief groups, um... You know, I want to make sure that the our group attendees leave with, um, you know, a light heart because sometimes we tap into some pretty strong emotions, and I don't want anyone walking out of our building feeling like um, they're just this open wound. And so, you guys have done an amazing job today, sharing and making um, what you are dealing with so transparent. And I thank you for that. And so I'd like to lead us, um, leave us kind of on a, a gentler, a happier note. Um, it was mentioned earlier that dancing and singing and laughing is a great way to self-care. So this is um, an article I found probably 10 years ago. And it's, What Does Love Mean to, for, to Children Ages 4 to 8? These are legitimate quotes. <laughs> when my grandmother got arthritis... She couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands hands got arthritis too. That is love. Rebecca, age eight. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Billy, age four. Love is what makes you smile when you're tired. Terry, age four. Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening the presents and you just listen. Bobby, age seven. If you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend that you hate. (laughs) Nika, age six. (laughs) We need a few more Nikas on this this planet, right? (laughs) Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt. And then he wears it every single day. (laughs) Noel, age seven. Love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. (laughs) Elaine, age five. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he's as handsome as Robert Redford. (laughs) Chris, age seven. 
Love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left him alone all day. Mary Ann, age four. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. Jessica, age eight. And one final quote from author and lecturer, lecturer Leo Bazagalia once talked about a contest he was asked to judge. The purpose of the contest was to find the most caring child. The winner was a four-year-old child whose next door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had just lost his wife. Upon seeing the man cry, the little boy went into the old gentleman's yard, climbed onto his lap, and sat there. When his mother asked what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said, nothing, I just helped him cry. Oh. And Leo's last quote is, it's not enough to have lived. We should be determined to live for something. May I suggest that it be by creating joy for others, sharing what we have for the betterment of person kind, bringing hope to the lost and love to the lonely. And I thank you all so much for letting me hang out with you this morning.